Up next, we've got three very heavy hitters in the, transport in the transportation field who are going to cover everything from ride sharing to electric vehicles. When will self-driving cars go mainstream? Will cars become connected enough to become the new smartphones? Please welcome, in conversation with journalist David Baru, International Transport Forum's Jose Viegas, Renault's Carlos Ghosn, and Blah Blah Car's Nicolas Brousson. Welcome. Hi to everyone, I'm uh, David Barou from the French newspaper Les Echos. Um, as you all know, the, uh, the future of the automobile is going to be very different. We are at a crossroad. Uh, tomorrow's car and transportation system will be uh, very different. Uh, the automobile will be more and more autonomous and connected, uh, more and more shared, and more and more green, meaning that uh, from traditional oil, we will move to electricity, hydrogen, new form of energy. What will this change for consumers, people, policymakers, car manufacturers, and uh, companies in general, and uh, startup in particular? I know that many of you in the audience today are startups, and it will be interesting to see what you can do in this new universe. To talk about this, we have uh, a very good uh, lineup. Uh, Nicolas Brusson, who is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Blablacar. Uh, José Viegas, who is the Secretary General of the International Transportation Forum, which is linked to the OECD in Paris, and Carlos Ghosn, who is the Chairman and uh, CEO of the Renault-Nissan Alliance. Let me start up right away with maybe uh, Nicola. Nicola, nice to meet you. Um, just a few words about car sharing today. Do you see it as still growing? How fast will it grow? And the follow-up question will be today, uh, car sharing is mainly on the highway for long distance. Do you see a future for also car sharing in uh, urban areas? Yeah, so if I, uh, you know, if I step back from like where we started um, like uh, 10 years or nine years ago, I think we first pitched Black Black on nine years ago. And, uh, and back then we described what we wanted to do, which was this community, this marketplace between drivers and passengers uh, sharing rides between city. And, uh, and nine years ago, you know, the feedback we got was guys, you know, it's silly, it's never going to work. Uh, if you get 100,000 people actually using this service, it's a miracle. Um, so we, we often underestimate, underestimate like the pace of change and how quickly things happen. Uh, because like eight or nine years later, you're talking about 40 million people on Baba car sharing a ride between cities. Uh, you know, we're in 22 countries. Um, today we transport uh, 4 million people actually every month. Uh, that's growing pretty fast, right? So if I think of that phenomenon, it's something that people thought would be silly and impossible like nine years ago. Uh, today it's pretty mainstream, uh, but it's just the beginning, right? So y if I look at the, the potential of carpooling or ride sharing, um, it's still, we're still at the infancy uh, of that. And if I think of the, the two things that we've seen happening over the last 35 years, um, one is the car is increasingly connected. Uh, not connected because of the car or in-car technology, connected because you have a mobile phone in your car, right? So today you track yourself on ways, you can push a button, get a car on Uber. Uh, so you know, that was one of the big revolution. I think the other and probably more fundamental revolution we've seen and that we observe uh, with our members at, uh, at Baba Car is the fact that the car is shareable, right? So today it's a shared asset. Uh, so if you think of the car, it's always been designed to have like four seats or five seats or even seven seats. And most of the time, you use the car alone, right? So it's a huge waste, it's a huge inefficiency. Uh, and people have been trying to crack that for a long time. People have always tried to share their ride, you each hike in the 70s. And it never worked because you did not have the technology, you did not have the, tech the, the social network, uh, you didn't have the momentum. I think it's changing now, right? So, so if I fast forward to like five, 10 years, I think most cars will be shared, right? So you'll find that uh, you know, whether it's long distance or short distance, uh, I think we are at the beginning of that. How long will it take before it becomes a, a commodity in the, the daily life that we use uh, car sharing services to go to work? Not only to go on vacation, but to go to work. What are the roadblocks to make it possible? Uh, is it a lot far away or very quickly, you think? Yeah, so if I think of like what we've seen, and, and I guess the, the chance we have is we observe people actually using the service so we understand what they do. Uh, I think the reason like sharing a ride took place first in long distance is because you have the right economics, right? So if you think of like the money you're gonna save on uh, a Lisbon to Madrid trip, it's a lot larger than on a, on a short trip, right? Yeah. So economically, it makes more sense. And then you're probably willing 
you have more friction in the process because you're going for a long journey, mm -hmm. right? So if you're going from Lisbon to Madrid, you're probably gonna be in a car for like five, six or seven hours. So waiting like 15 minutes for people to show up, uh, to have like four people in a car, it's acceptable. Deal, yeah. If you go to work every day, you end up being very, very time sensitive. So I think that's where technology is gonna, is gonna have a play, right? If we can connect people faster because the car is being tracked, because everybody's being tracked geographically, uh, I think you'll be able to match people on shorter and shorter journeys. So what we've seen with Blah Blah Car is when, when we start a new, a new country, we tend to start with very long journeys, typically like 200 miles, and over time, people start using Blah Blah Car as we get more liquidity in the marketplace, people start using Blah Blah Car on like shorter and shorter journeys. Mm. So I think it's, it, it's happening and technology and geolocation and social networks are helping with that. Mr. Gohn, when you talk about this uh, car sharing, do you see it as a, as a threat to the car manufacturer or do you see it as, a, as an opportunity? How do you approach that in, at Renault Nissan? Well, uh, I think we, we, we see it as an opportunity because we, we absolutely don't refuse it. We are trying to develop a lot of services supporting, uh, you know, shared uh, cars or shared services. We have initiatives announced every day about that. Uh, we think everything which is around connected services is going to be a, a very uh, uh, growing part of our business. I don't think it's a contradiction with our classical business about selling cars. I think it's a complement. Uh, it's a complement to it. So we look at all the experiences with a lot of interest, and obviously we are having our own experiences. We are having our own collaboration or partnership. You see a lot of car manufacturers going into different direction. We're trying to assess how far this is going to go in our industry, beside our normal business. Mm. You announced today that you would try something new in Paris with Nissan. Yeah, with the, with the launch of the new Micra of Nissan in Europe, we announced a program which is called Nissan Intelligent uh, Get and Go Micra, where, in fact, we're going to be creating communities around one particular car. Obviously, they're going to be a social profiling and a geo uh, Localization. Uh, exactly. Uh, scrutinization in order to get people compatible between themselves to own a car and they will be paying in function of the use of the car. This is another experience. How far is this going to go? How successful is it going to be? We don't know. But I think all car makers, it would be reasonable to say all car makers take connected services very seriously. Uh, it's absolutely not in contradiction or in competition with the flurry of developments that are taking place. But we think there is part of the market is going to go into this direction. And I don't think it's a threat to our business because at the same time that there is a need for more car sharing, more share, sharing more services, the development of the connectivity of the car is going to make the car a personal mobile space. You know, uh, for example, the day you're going to have an autonomous connected car where you're going to be into the car and you're going to be able to have a video conference, start working while into the car and the car is driving you. You don't want anybody with you, mm -hmm. I mean, because it becomes a working space. It's bec become a space where you are dealing with your family, you're dealing with your colleague, you're solving problems, you're consulting a doctor. So I think there is a place for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, and particularly connectivity of the car is going to also push toward making the car a more personal space where you're going to be able to work, connect while you're being transported. Mm -hmm. The car industry is cool again, it's exciting, we see new products, we expect the car to change much more in the next coming years than it has changed in the last few years. But aren't you afraid that the value created by this new car environment will actually be, be captured by uh, uh, new startups like uh, Blablaka, who come from the service side, or giants of the internet like uh, Google or Apple? Uh, frankly, I don't know. I think there is a space for everybody. Uh, that means um, uh, Blablaka is delivering a service and they're going to specialize in it, and they are extending it, and it's great. Uh, we are going to be developing different kinds of services. Uh, what I, I see, I see more as a, as you said, the car 15 years ago was considered a little bit as a commodity, or most of the cars considered as a commodity. Today, as you said, it's cool again. You know, young people are interested in it, particularly with the connectivity coming and the autonomous cars and the electric cars. It's more compatible with uh, the environment. It's much more connected. Uh, it's much more fun because you're going to be able to drive whenever you want and stop driving whenever you want. So, and this is something which is very good, particularly for car makers who want to sell based on technology and value and not only on discount. Mm. When do you see that this future car will become a reality, the driverless car? Is it two, three, five, ten years from here? Well, I, I think electric cars is a reality. That means, uh, I mean, today, uh, this year, 500,000 electric cars will be sold. 
50,000 electric cars were sold five years ago. So you have an exponential. And what's interesting is that this is a market which is booming in different areas of the world that nobody suspected. It's China today, which represents one third of all the electric cars sold. Uh, Norway uh, in Europe is one of the uh, most, uh, uh, you know, uh, growing mm. uh, uh, market. But France is following uh, the United States, depending on the state. So we are seeing pop-ups in electric cars. But I think electric cars are going to become absolutely indispensable when COP22 will come not only to our objective is to limit climate, uh, that means temperature to two degrees, but how we're going to do it. Mm. When they're going to go to the how, then you're going to see a lot of constraints going into industry and transportation is going to have to bring its own contribution. So what's taking place today, which is more technology, added value, the car go moving from an object of transportation to a mobile space where you can work, you can spend time, you can connect, is a very important transformation for us and, and, and very positive. Before we move to public policy, and, and Jose, one and last question maybe to, to, to Nicolas. Uber is investing into uh, its own cars. It's, it, we s it sees a future with it might, where it might own cars. It's testing uh, driverless, uh, driverless cars in, in the US. Do you think that BlaBlaCar one day might also own its own fleet of cars to become a service company? and it will share cars? Or do you think that your business model will always be to be just a go-between users? No, I, I, I think it's, I mean, you're talking about two very different businesses, right? So, so Uber is really about like in-city, on-demand type service where you press a button, a car is coming, and the car is gonna drive you wherever you wanna go. So today you have a driver in the car, maybe one day the car is gonna drive itself. I, if you think of Black Black Car, what we're doing is a community of people sharing rides. So, so if I think of like the, you know, the mission of blah blah car long term is every car should be a blah blah car in a sense that every car should or could be shared, right? So our job in a way now and in the future is gonna be how do we pull people into a car? And I think we'll stay at that layer of like building a community and matching people based on trust, based on their travel intent, based on their profile. We pull people into a car so that they travel together. Whether it's to do 200 miles or 10 miles or five miles, we pull people together, right? Jose, uh, we see that there is a bright future and future in, the in a sense for, for car transportation. But today, if you look at cars in cities, it's more a problem than, than a solution. Um, do you see public policy approach to this new car of uh, new type of car environment? How will they react to that? Do you see uh, public policy makers willing to really push for a different car environment? Is it easy or it's really, really tough because you have to take care of the existing situation? Certainly, it is difficult, but they will be forced to adapt because the technology is there, but at the same time, the congestion is there and the carbon emissions and the pollution is there. So we have opportunities and we have big challenges. For instance, we've launched a big project on decarbonizing transport in which we're looking at all the solutions that have to be engaged, not only on the technological side, but also on the business model side to make possible to have a carbon neutral transport across the world over during this century. Some countries will be getting there maybe in 30 or 40 years, others in 60 or 70 years, but it's going in that direction. Shared rides, either demand driven from Ubers and likes or supply driven like Mablaka when you are owning the car and bringing there is a necessary component because one of the things that happens is that you bring electric mobility the operating cost of the car per kilometer is much lower than on fossil fuels. So the tendency to drive even more will grow and we simply do not have space for that. So there has to be other ways to rationalize the common good that is the road space. But we have the impression that regulation needs to change a lot, that it's going to be, there will be many roadblocks. Technology will exist, but that regulation for insurance, who is responsible in case of an accident, where do you park the cars? All those kind of stuff. Regulation will actually make things much go much slower than maybe technology would go. Well, that's why we as an intergovernmental organization that provides knowledge and advice to the ministers, we're trying to move ahead of the problem so that when the problem really hits them, we have already some suggestions. We've done some studies, not only on the potential of shared mobility, and we've shown that with today's technology, you can reduce congestion and emissions by about a third which is huge. There's no other solution so powerful in the short term. But also we've been looking at the evolution of regulation. And we are 
suggesting that we should move from a paradigm of data poor regulation heavy, which is the paradigm of the past in which you app regulation is kind of by precaution, to another paradigm in which you have a data rich environment that allows you to be regulation light and you adjust on the go. Mm. So it's a new style. It's data driven policy and regulation. You have the data that allows you to fine tune the parameters instead of defining once and then leave it there for 10 years. It's a big challenge, even culturally, for the governments. But it will be the only way that we can provide good quality of life in our cities, in the large cities, giving people access and letting them enjoy life instead of being complaining all the time about congestion, air quality, and all the rest. So there's massive opportunity. But we know that it's not only industry that has to adapt, but also governments that has to adapt. My impression is that regulation has been kind of slowing things down. I don't know how BlaBlaCar is approaching regulation. Is regulation helping you? Or in some countries, my impression that it's actually uh, trying to block or slow you down because uh, you are disturbing uh, traditional business models. No, in a way, we've been, we've been pretty lucky on that, right? Because the, the old paradigm of BlaBlaCar was sharing cost, right? So it's about like a driver that's going to drive anyway between you know, Madrid and Lisbon sharing his ride or a ride and getting free passengers contributing to that cost. And because it's all about cost sharing, we never had any major regulation problem around the fact that is your taxi driver, is your professional driver, it was around sharing cost. So, so it's kind of interesting because we've been able to disrupt behaviors in a way, like it's a complete new behavior, like you know, for someone to offer a ride or a seat in his car was completely new as a behavior uh, without any like um, a true roadblock on the regulation side. And it's almost when you get to a scale where we are today and the scale where we, I hope, will be tomorrow, when regulators come in and say, wow, that's interesting. There is a new consumer behavior. What is the regulation saying? How is it working? Um, I, I, I think having said that, the, the beauty of what we do is it makes sense, right? So if you think of blah, blah, car, it just makes sense. So policymakers and regulators are actually yeah, helping you today? Or right now, I would say most of the discussion, if not all the discussions we've had, especially in Brussels, for example, people are very supportive because they understand it's about reducing traffic. It just makes sense to pull people into a vehicle uh, and to reduce the number of vehicles and improve the usage of the vehicle long term. Um, so I would say for that reason, and you know, there is a notion of like doing good and, and the fact that I guess we're doing good, uh, long term you get regulators on your side. Jose, yeah, just an example. Just like this is new for the industry, this is very new for governments and regulators. One of the projects we've made was about the potential of shared mobility and in particular shared taxis. Guess what? In the majority of the European countries, the shared taxi is illegal. So it, has, it takes time for the governments to understand, but because we have direct access to the ministers and sometimes also to the mayors, we believe that the evidence that we are providing is making them aware. And in fact, we now have several cities which have asked us to simulate the potential of that shared mobility solution for those cities. And this is opening up the, the windows and fresh air is coming in. Mm. So I think they will understand that it's a necessity that there will be a new style of policy making and regulation. And at Renault Nissan, how do you see regulation? Do you see regulation as something that is slowing you down or actually regulators are pushing you to accelerate? Uh, no, I, I, don't think, I don't think they are slowing us down. I think in a certain way we consider, for example, when it comes to autonomous car, we consider the regulator as a partner. Why? Because we need first, when we are in a development phase, we are maintaining contact with the different governments. For example, in Japan, uh, the Japanese government is aware of all the developments we make. In the United States, we do the same thing. In France, we do the same thing. Why? Because we want them to understand where this technology is going. So when we come with a request for a regulation, it doesn't come as a surprise. They have been through the whole process of the development of the technology. And why it's important? Because they can influence also the development of the technology before the technology is ready. But after this, there is no mass marketing of any of these technology without their approval. So in a certain way, I think depending on the technology, for example, for electric cars, there is a lot of support for development of zero emission. So we, we get a lot of support. Autonomous car, they sense that there is a lot of advantage for the consumer through autonomous cars or even uh, cars without, uh, without a driver. So there is a lot of support. So I cannot say that they are blocking it or slowing it, but I think if we can <laughs> establish a good relationship during the development phase, explain the technology, and obviously their difficulty is they're having competing technology coming from different car makers and they have to make a decision, but then we are interested into the outcome because the outcome 
we want it to be as coherent possible. I mean, if the Chinese come with a regulation on autonomous car different than the American or than the Japanese, we have a problem. You want a global type exactly. Of what we want. That's why we we are interested into collaborating with uh, uh, organization uh, like his organization because he can coordinate and make sure that regulation coming in different countries are coherent. Mm. And insurance, will insurance be a, a, a major roadblock for you? Who will be responsible if there is an autonomous car in the future and there is an accident? Because 100% reliability doesn't exist. Well, I in a certain way, when we talk about advantage for the consumer, that means obviously in front of the explosion of technology that we're seeing, we're guided by what's the interest of the consumer. Why we think autonomous cars are, are interesting? Because, for example, if you take insurance, 90% of the accidents on cars today are due to human error, 90%. So if you move towards autonomous car, you're going to reduce uh, drastically the accidents because when the car is on auto automated pilot, it's going to respect speed limit, it's going to stop on the red light, it's, uh, it, it's, it's going to respect strictly it all the code. Drink. It doesn't drink. Uh, it doesn't drink, <laughs> it doesn't sleep, it doesn't etc. So what I'm saying is, uh, the insurance should go down because the number of accidents is going to go down. So it's good for the consumer. First, it's safer. And second, he should see the premium, the insurance pre premium going down. So that's why I think particularly the regulator is very interested because there is a benefit for the consumer, but there is also for benefit for the policymakers because it's safer. Mm. And insurance in the type of uh, blah, blah, car services, how have you been able to solve the insurance problem? That is, has this been slowing you down or not really? No, it's not. So, so two things. I mean, a, you know, if I go back to the old car sharing paradigm, the, the fact that the driver is not professional, he's not doing that as a job, you don't have an insurance problem. And what we've done is we are reinforced the insurance product by doing a partnership with AXA. So it's a pan-European partnership we, we scaled last year. Uh, and essentially what we do is we add insurance both on the driver side and the passenger side. So over time, I guess we, you know, we'll add more and more insurance, but there is no fundamental problem around insurance. And, and just to maybe go back on, um, on regulators, I mean, what I found, you know, running a startup company, I never thought I would talk to regulators, right? So in a way, it's a, it's a good problem, right? So it means you, you're at scale. Um, but what I discovered, especially with um, at the European Commission in Brussels, uh, when you go talk to regulators, actually they tend to listen, right? So most of the time, um, it's an issue of misinformation. Right, so if you go and, and say, well, here's what we're doing, here's what Babacar is about, here's the problem we're trying to solve, here is what the consumers are doing, because at the end, the regulators are protecting the general public. Uh, so if you explain that, uh, things, things tend to go pretty well, actually. Right, so it takes time, but things tend to go pretty well. Mr. Gorn, a, a question about startups, because it's a big environment with a lot of startups. At a big company like Renault Nissan, how do you try to work with the startups? Will they help you solve this problem? How open are you? to really try to cooperate more than maybe try to own all the technology? Look, th there are different kinds of collaboration. There are collaboration which are driven by us, and it's much easier. Well, obviously, by definition, a startup is very open. So when you go and cont contact a startup, they are very open for collaborating with a large a company like this. For example, we are, in some cases, making acquisitions because we need the engineering power existing in a startup. That's one case. Second case, we have a collaboration with a startup where we are investing in a startup. We are co-developing with the startup because we want the startup to be completely independent and free compared to our own paradigms in terms of development. This is the second case. These things are going relatively easily. But there is a third case where the startup takes the initiative toward the OEM, and this is much more complicated because you know, usually startups are small teams. When they want to what? Disrupt you know, what you're doing? Or you know, uh, blah, blah, cars is sell selling me about 600 people. Uh, you know, Renault Nissan has 450,000. So wh when, when they're going to contact us, uh, and it's divided in many pieces. You have services in the financing company. You have services in marketing. You have services in after sales. And he wants to address somebody who can cover all these areas. So this is where we need to ourselves modify our organization so we can put people who can cover all the proposals coming from the startups. We have 20 uh, seconds left. So do you yeah. have like an entry point for startups at Renault Nissan? Just no, but, but we will have to. We will have to create an entry point, particularly for connected services. So when people want to come and propose something, we can efficiently process the, 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 the potential. When will this door be open, you think? Well, this is within the next uh, months because I think it's moving very quickly. I think from one side it's easy, from the other side it's a little bit more complicated.
Thank you very much to uh, three uh, panelists. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.